the history of the Catholic Church and what happened. In many ways, the first book was the Bible. I mean, literally. All of us do things every day which are unreasonable, sinful, wrong, and absurd. Joe Rogan delves into one of the most mysterious and controversial topics in religious history, the Apocrypha, also known as the Lost Books of the Bible. And so it isn't that the Bible is true. It's that the Bible is the precondition for the manifestation of truth. Like, what are these things? Are they good or bad? And, um, and I think some of them are bad. These ancient texts, omitted from the traditional biblical canon, have long sparked debate among theologians, historians, and scholars. God doesn't exist. Human being is the, is the, is the measure of all things. The Bible got it right. They yeah. got the order right. Right. Rogan explores the origins, significance, and hidden stories within these forgotten scriptures. The Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch, powerful book. You know that Enoch was a real powerful man because he's talked about in the Bible, yet his book is not in the Bible. <laughs> the Lost Books of the Bible, also known as the Apocrypha or non-canonical texts, have fascinated scholars, theologians, and laypeople alike for centuries. These texts provide us with a glimpse into a forgotten world of religious thought, shedding light on alternative narratives, teachings, and insights that were once widely circulated but were later excluded from the official canon of the Bible. These books have remained hidden from most modern believers and have sparked curiosity about what they contain, why they were left out, and how they could change the way we understand our religious history. Today, we delve deep into the lost books of the Bible, the mysteries they hold, and why they were never included in the religious texts that have shaped much of the world's spiritual landscape. To start, let's discuss what the Apocrypha actually is. The term Apocrypha comes from the Greek word meaning hidden or obscure. In religious terms, it refers to ancient writings that were either excluded from the official canon of the Bible or considered of questionable authenticity. The books in question were often written during the intertestamental period, the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and include various gospels, letters, and prophecies. One of the key reasons these books were left out of the Bible is that early church leaders debated their authenticity. Some of the texts were seen as heretical or doctrinally problematic, while others simply didn't align with the theological framework that was being established in the early church. Nevertheless, these texts provide valuable insights into early Christianity, Jewish thought, and religious practices of the time. Among the most well-known apocryphal books are the Gospels of Thomas, Mary, and Judas, along with the Book of Enoch and the Shepherd of Hermas. Each of these books provides a different perspective on biblical events, figures, and teachings, but they also raise profound questions about faith, authority, and the formation of religious doctrine, the Gospel of Thomas. Let's begin with one of the most famous apocryphal texts, the Gospel of Thomas. Unlike the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of sayings attributed to Jesus, many of which are unfamiliar to mainstream Christian teachings. Discovered in 1945 as part of the Nag Hammadi Library, a treasure trove of Gnostic texts, this gospel is unique in that it offers a different take on the teachings of Christ. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus speaks in a more mystical and cryptic manner. For example, one of the sayings states, Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. This suggests a more pantheistic view of Jesus' presence in the natural world, contrasting with the more straightforward narratives found in the canonical gospels. Some scholars believe that the Gospel of Thomas represents an early pre-Orthodox form of Christianity, one that emphasized personal enlightenment and self-knowledge over institutional doctrine. However, the reason this Gospel was not included in the New Testament is that early church leaders viewed it as promoting Gnostic beliefs, which were deemed heretical. Gnosticism was a religious movement that emphasized esoteric knowledge and the idea that the material world is inherently corrupt. This was in stark contrast to the emerging Orthodox view that Jesus came to redeem the material world, not to reject it. As a result, the Gospel of Thomas was excluded from the canon. 
the Gospel of Mary. Another fascinating text is the Gospel of Mary, which presents a completely different perspective on the role of women in early Christianity. In this Gospel, Mary Magdalene plays a prominent role as a disciple who has received special knowledge from Jesus. The text reveals that the male disciples were jealous of Mary's closeness to Jesus and her understanding of his teachings. In this Gospel, Peter questions why Jesus would have chosen to reveal his teachings to a woman, to which Mary responds with grace and wisdom. The text highlights the early tensions surrounding the role of women in the church and suggests that Mary Magdalene was far more influential than traditional Christian teachings have portrayed her to be. The Gospel of Mary was likely excluded from the New Testament due to its portrayal of women as spiritual leaders, which was at odds with the male-dominated church hierarchy that developed in the centuries following Jesus' death. The early church sought to establish a unified doctrine and texts that promoted alternative views, especially those that empowered women, were suppressed. The Gospel of Judas Next we have the Gospel of Judas, which offers a completely different take on one of the Bible's most infamous figures. In the canonical Gospels, Judas Iscariot is portrayed as the betrayer of Jesus. The disciple who hands him over to the authorities in exchange for 30 pieces of silver. However, in the Gospel of Judas, Judas is not the villain of the story, but rather a hero who is acting according to Jesus' wishes. According to this Gospel, Jesus asks Judas to betray him so that he can fulfill his destiny of being crucified. Rather than being condemned for his actions, Judas is portrayed as the only disciple who truly understood Jesus' mission. This radical reinterpretation of Judas's role in the Passion narrative challenges the traditional view of betrayal and redemption. The Gospel of Judas was likely excluded from the New Testament because it conflicted with the orthodox interpretation of Judas as a traitor. Additionally, the text promotes Gnostic ideas, which were deemed heretical by early church leaders. Nevertheless, this gospel offers a thought-provoking alternative to the familiar narrative and raises important questions about destiny, free will, and the nature of betrayal. The Book of Enoch The Book of Enoch is another apocryphal text that has captured the imaginations of scholars and believers alike. This ancient Jewish text, attributed to the biblical figure Enoch, was widely read in the early centuries of Christianity, but was ultimately excluded from the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Old Testament. One of the most fascinating aspects of the Book of Enoch is its detailed account of the Watchers, a group of angels who descended to earth and took human wives, leading to the birth of the Nephilim, a race of giants mentioned briefly in the Book of Genesis. The Watchers are depicted as corrupting humanity by teaching forbidden knowledge, such as metallurgy, astrology, and sorcery. As a result, they are punished by God and imprisoned until the final judgment. The Book of Enoch also contains vivid descriptions of heaven, hell, and the afterlife, as well as prophecies about the coming of a messianic figure. These themes were influential in the development of early Jewish and Christian apocalyptic literature. Yet the text was excluded from the Bible due to its controversial content and its association with Gnostic and apocryphal teachings. The Shepherd of Hermas Moving on, The Shepherd of Hermas is a lesser-known apocryphal text that was widely read in early Christian communities and was even considered for inclusion in the New Testament by some early church fathers. The text is an allegorical work that recounts the visions of Hermas, a former slave who becomes a Christian. The central theme of the Shepherd of Hermas is repentance, and the text emphasizes the importance of moral purity and perseverance in the face of sin. Hermas is guided by a divine figure known as the Shepherd, who instructs him on how to live a righteous life and warns him about the dangers of falling away from the faith. While the Shepherd of Hermas was highly regarded by early Christians, it was ultimately excluded from the New Testament due to its allegorical nature and its emphasis on works-based salvation, which conflicted with the doctrine of salvation by grace that was becoming central to Christian theology. The Controversial Process of Canonization The exclusion of these texts from the Bible raises an important question. Who decided which books would be included in the canon, and why? 
The process of canonization, the selection of which books would be considered divinely inspired and authoritative, was a long and complex one, involving debates among church leaders, theologians, and scholars. In the early centuries of Christianity, there was no single, unified Bible. Instead, different communities had their own collections of sacred texts, and these collections varied widely in content. Some communities included the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, and other apocryphal texts, while others did not. The canonization process began in earnest in the 4th century, when church leaders sought to establish a definitive list of books that would be considered authoritative for all Christians. The criteria for inclusion were varied, but they generally focused on factors such as apostolic authorship, doctrinal consistency, and widespread usage in Christian worship. Books that were deemed heretical or inconsistent with the emerging Orthodox theology were excluded from the canon. This process was not without controversy, and debates over the inclusion of certain books continued for centuries. Ultimately, the canonization process was solidified at the Council of Carthage in 397 AD, when the 27 books of the New Testament were officially recognized. The Rediscovery of the Apocrypha For centuries, the lost books of the Bible remained hidden from mainstream Christian belief. However, the rediscovery of these texts in the 19th and 20th centuries, thanks to archaeological discoveries such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library, has reignited interest in these ancient writings. The Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in the caves of Qumran in 1947, contain fragments of many apocryphal and pseudepigraphal texts, including the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, and the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. These scrolls provide valuable insight into the religious beliefs and practices of the Jewish sect known as the Essenes, as well as the broader religious landscape of Second Temple Judaism. The Nag Hammadi Library, discovered in Egypt in 1945, contains a treasure trove of Gnostic texts, including the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, and the Gospel of Truth. These texts shed light on the diversity of early Christian thought and the ways in which Gnostic beliefs influenced the development of Christian theology. The rediscovery of these texts has prompted scholars to reconsider the formation of the Bible and the reasons why certain books were included, while others were excluded. Some have argued that the exclusion of the Apocrypha was driven more by political and theological concerns than by a genuine assessment of their spiritual value. The Impact of the Apocrypha on Modern Christianity The lost books of the Bible have had a profound impact on modern Christianity, even though they are not considered part of the official canon. These texts challenge traditional narratives, offer alternative perspectives on biblical events, and raise important questions about the nature of faith, authority, and revelation. For many believers, the Apocrypha provides a deeper understanding of the historical and cultural context in which the Bible was written. These texts offer insights into the religious beliefs and practices of early Jewish and Christian communities and they help us to see the Bible as a living document that has evolved over time. For others, the Apocrypha serves as a reminder that the Bible is not a monolithic text, but a collection of writings that reflects a diversity of voices and perspectives. These lost books challenge us to think critically about the process of canonization and to consider how the decisions made by early church leaders have shaped our understanding of Scripture. Continuing our journey through the intriguing world of the lost books of the Bible, let's dive deeper into these texts, their impact, and how they resonate with modern spiritual seekers. With thousands of years of history behind these books, they offer a wealth of information, challenges to establish traditions, and new ways of thinking about religion and faith. The Concept of Hidden Knowledge and Esoteric Teachings one of the most captivating aspects of the lost books of the Bible is the theme of hidden knowledge or esoteric teachings. Many of these texts are tied to Gnostic traditions, which emphasize secret wisdom accessible only to a select few. This concept challenges the more open, public nature of mainstream Christianity, where salvation and understanding are available to all through scripture and church teachings. 
Gnosticism itself teaches that the material world is flawed or even corrupt, and that true salvation lies in acquiring knowledge about the divine realm, knowledge that can transcend the limitations of the physical world. This focus on enlightenment through hidden wisdom is central to many of the apocryphal texts. For example, the Gospel of Thomas contains a passage where Jesus says, Let him who seeks continue seeking until he finds. When he finds, he will become troubled. When he becomes troubled, he will be astonished and he will rule over the all. This passage suggests that the path to enlightenment is not easy. It is fraught with difficulty and requires deep spiritual searching. But once the truth is found, it brings with it a profound understanding that transforms one's entire perception of existence. In the Gnostic tradition, this idea of hidden knowledge is often framed as a direct revelation from divine beings or from Christ himself. The Apocalypse of Peter, another apocryphal text, presents an alternate version of Christ's teachings where the truth about the nature of reality is revealed to Peter in secret visions. These hidden teachings emphasize that understanding of divine truth often requires going beyond conventional interpretations and delving into the metaphysical, the mystical, and the deeply personal. This focus on secret knowledge is one of the reasons the Gnostic Gospels and similar apocryphal texts were excluded from the biblical canon. Early church leaders saw Gnosticism as a threat to the developing Christian doctrine, which emphasized faith, grace, and salvation through the church and its teachings. The idea that salvation or enlightenment could be attained outside of the institutional structure of the church was seen as dangerous and divisive. But even today, the allure of hidden knowledge and spiritual discovery resonates with many. The apocryphal texts invite us to question the nature of divine truth and to consider whether spiritual insight can be found outside of established religious institutions. They encourage a personal, often individualistic approach to faith, one that emphasizes inner transformation and the quest for deeper meaning. The Role of Women in the Apocrypha Another significant theme in many of the lost books of the Bible is the role of women in early Christian communities and their relationship to Jesus. The canonical Gospels present a somewhat limited view of women's involvement in Jesus' ministry often focusing on male apostles such as Peter, James, and John. However, several apocryphal texts suggest that women played a much more prominent and spiritually significant role than is acknowledged in the official New Testament. The Gospel of Mary, for instance, elevates Mary Magdalene to a position of importance, portraying her as one of Jesus' closest and most trusted disciples. In this Gospel, Mary is not merely a follower of Jesus, but someone who has received special revelations and insights directly from him. She offers wisdom and guidance to the other disciples, challenging the traditional, patriarchal structure of early Christian leadership. One of the most striking passages in the Gospel of Mary occurs when Peter expresses doubt about Mary's authority, asking why Jesus would have revealed his teachings to a woman. In response, Mary stands firm, confident in her understanding of the divine message. The text emphasizes her role as a leader and spiritual guide, a portrayal that challenges the male-centric hierarchy that dominated early Christianity. Other apocryphal texts also highlight the significant roles that women played in early Christian communities. The Acts of Paul and Thecla tells the story of Thecla, a young woman who becomes a disciple of Paul and dedicates her life to preaching the gospel. Despite opposition from both her family and society, Thecla is portrayed as a courageous and devout follower of Christ, performing miracles and converting others to the faith. The role of women in these texts has sparked considerable debate among scholars and religious thinkers. Some argue that the exclusion of these texts from the Bible reflects a deliberate attempt by early church leaders to suppress the involvement of women in positions of spiritual authority. Others believe that the apocryphal texts simply represent alternative views that were not widely accepted by the broader Christian community. Whatever the case may be, the portrayal of women in the lost books of the Bible offers a more nuanced and complex picture of early Christianity. These texts suggest 
that women were not just passive participants in the faith, but active leaders, teachers, and spiritual guides. For modern readers, they provide a compelling vision of a more inclusive and egalitarian form of Christianity, one in which women's voices are heard and respected. The Apocalyptic Visions of the Apocrypha Many of the lost books of the Bible are also apocalyptic in nature, offering vivid descriptions of the end times, divine judgment, and the ultimate fate of humanity. These texts often present a more detailed and elaborate picture of the afterlife, with specific references to heaven, hell, and the process of salvation. The Apocalypse of Peter, for example, provides a graphic description of the torments that await sinners in hell. This text is one of the earliest Christian visions of the afterlife and was widely read in the early church, even though it was ultimately excluded from the New Testament. In this apocryphal apocalypse, Peter is given a tour of hell by Christ himself, where he witnesses the punishments that various sinners endure. Those who have committed specific sins such as blasphemy, murder, and adultery are subjected to corresponding torments in the afterlife. The Book of Enoch, another important apocryphal text, also contains apocalyptic themes. In this book, the prophet Enoch is taken on a journey through the heavens, where he witnesses the celestial realms and learns about the fate of the Watchers, the fallen angels who rebelled against God and taught forbidden knowledge to humanity. Enoch also receives visions of the final judgment when the righteous will be rewarded and the wicked will be punished. These apocalyptic visions offer a fascinating glimpse into the religious imagination of early Jewish and Christian communities. They reflect a deep concern with the ultimate destiny of humanity and the moral consequences of sin. While the canonical Gospels contain some references to the end times, such as Jesus' teachings about the kingdom of God and the final judgment, the apocryphal texts provide a much more detailed and elaborate picture of these events. For many early Christians, these apocalyptic visions served as a source of comfort and hope, offering reassurance that justice would ultimately prevail and that the righteous would be vindicated. At the same time, they also served as a warning to those who strayed from the path of righteousness, emphasizing the importance of moral purity and spiritual vigilance. The exclusion of these apocalyptic texts from the Bible may reflect a desire by early church leaders to promote a more balanced and less fear-driven approach to faith. While the canonical Gospels emphasize God's love, mercy, and forgiveness, the apocryphal texts often focus more on divine wrath and judgment. This stark contrast in tone and content may have contributed to their exclusion from the official canon. The mystical and symbolic nature of the apocryphal texts one of the most intriguing aspects of the lost books of the Bible is their mystical and symbolic nature. Many of these texts are filled with rich imagery, allegories, and metaphors that invite readers to explore deeper spiritual meanings. For example, the Gospel of Philip, another Gnostic text found in the Nag Hammadi Library, presents a series of teachings about the nature of the divine, the role of the sacraments, and the relationship between the physical and spiritual worlds. This gospel uses symbolic language to describe the process of salvation, emphasizing the importance of spiritual union with the divine. One of the key themes in the Gospel of Philip is the concept of the bridal chamber, a metaphor for the mystical union between the soul and God. This imagery is reminiscent of the Song of Songs in the Old Testament, which uses the metaphor of a romantic relationship to describe the love between God and his people. In the Gospel of Philip, this union is seen as the ultimate goal of the spiritual journey, a transcendent state in which the soul is fully united with the divine. The Odes of Solomon, another apocryphal text, also contains mystical and symbolic language. This collection of hymns attributed to the biblical figure Solomon uses poetic imagery to express deep spiritual truths. The Odes describe the soul's journey toward God, the experience of divine love, and the joy of salvation. Like the Psalms in the canonical Bible, the Odes of Solomon offer a rich and evocative language of praise and worship, inviting readers to enter into a deeper relationship with the divine. 
These mystical and symbolic texts offer a different kind of spiritual experience than the more straightforward narratives found in the canonical Gospels. They encourage readers to engage with the text on a deeper, more contemplative level, exploring the hidden meanings and spiritual insights contained within the symbolism. For many modern spiritual seekers, these texts offer a refreshing alternative to the more literal and doctrinal approach of mainstream Christianity. The Rediscovery and Reappraisal of the Apocrypha in Modern Times The rediscovery of the lost books of the Bible in the 20th century has sparked renewed interest in these ancient texts. Archaeological discoveries such as the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library have provided scholars with new insights into the religious landscape of the ancient Near East and the diversity of early Jewish and Christian thought. In recent decades, there has been a growing movement among scholars, theologians, and spiritual seekers to reappraise the value of the Apocrypha. These texts are no longer dismissed as heretical or irrelevant. Instead, they are seen as valuable sources of spiritual insight and historical information. Many modern Christians, particularly those with an interest in mysticism, alternative spirituality, or early Christian history, have found inspiration in the lost books of the Bible. These texts offer new perspectives on familiar biblical themes and challenge us to think more deeply about the nature of faith, salvation, and the divine. The inclusion of the Apocrypha in modern biblical scholarship has also prompted a broader conversation about the nature of Scripture itself. What makes a text sacred? Who gets to decide which books are included in the Bible and which are excluded? These questions continue to be debated by scholars, theologians, and religious leaders today. In some Christian traditions, the Apocrypha is still included in the Bible, particularly in the Eastern Orthodox and Catholic churches, where certain apocryphal books are considered part of the biblical canon. In these traditions, books such as Tobit, Judith, and 1 and 2 Maccabees are regarded as sacred scripture even though they are not included in the Protestant Bible. The ongoing interest in the Apocrypha reflects a broader trend in modern spirituality. A desire to explore the full depth and richness of the religious tradition rather than being confined to a narrow, orthodox interpretation of Scripture. For many, the lost books of the Bible represent an invitation to question, to seek, and to discover new dimensions of faith. The Cultural and Literary Impact of the Apocrypha the lost books of the Bible have also had a profound impact on Western culture and literature. Over the centuries, these texts have inspired countless works of art, literature, music, and film, influencing the way we think about biblical themes and stories. For example, the story of Enoch and the fallen angels has been a major influence on Western literature, particularly in the genre of fantasy and science fiction. The idea of celestial beings descending to Earth and interacting with humanity has been explored in countless novels, films, and television shows. The Book of Enoch itself has inspired writers such as John Milton, whose epic poem Paradise Lost draws on themes of rebellion and divine punishment found in the apocryphal text. Similarly, the apocryphal stories of the infancy of Jesus, found in texts such as The Infancy Gospel of Thomas, have influenced depictions of the early life of Christ in art and literature. These stories, which describe miraculous events from Jesus' childhood, have been the subject of paintings, sculptures, and religious dramas throughout history. The lost books of the Bible have also inspired modern writers to explore themes of hidden knowledge, divine revelation, and spiritual transformation. Novels such as Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code draw on apocryphal texts and Gnostic traditions to create stories of intrigue and mystery centered on ancient religious secrets. In addition to their impact on literature, the Apocrypha has also influenced religious and philosophical thought. The Gnostic emphasis on inner knowledge and personal enlightenment has resonated with thinkers in various spiritual traditions, from Renaissance mystics to modern New Age practitioners. The cultural and literary legacy of the Apocrypha is a testament to the enduring power of these texts. Though they may not be included in the official canon, they continue to captivate the imaginations of people from all walks of life, 
offering a rich and diverse tapestry of stories, teachings, and spiritual insights. Conclusion In the end, the lost books of the Bible, whether they are viewed as heretical, enlightening, or simply mysterious, offer us a glimpse into a forgotten world of religious thought and debate. These texts provide valuable insights into the early history of Judaism and Christianity and challenge us to reconsider the boundaries of sacred scripture. While the Apocrypha may never be included in the official canon, they continue to captivate the imaginations of scholars and believers alike, reminding us that the story of the Bible is far from complete. As we continue to uncover new texts and explore the depths of these ancient writings, we are reminded of the richness and complexity of our religious heritage and the many voices that have contributed to the ongoing conversation about faith, truth, and the divine. These lost books offer us a chance to question, to learn, and to grow in our understanding of the sacred. Whether we accept them as divinely inspired or simply view them as historical artifacts, their impact on the world of faith is undeniable. And as we continue to explore the mysteries of the Apocrypha, we may find that the answers we seek are not hidden in the past, but waiting to be discovered in the present. Back in 2015, something huge went down in the Turkish town of Tokat, home to over 100,000 people. This small place turned out to be a hotspot for shady dealings. People were getting up to no good, trading in ancient stuff on the down low, with plans to make a quick buck on the black market. A team of law enforcers swoop in on an operation. They manage to snatch a bibli from the custody of these smugglers, saving it from being lost forever. This wasn't just any old Bible. It was one of the earliest versions ever made, dating back to the 2nd century. Right beside the rescued Bible, the authorities stumbled upon a treasure collection, piles of fancy jewelry and over 50 ancient coins. Over $5 billion go down the drain each year, thanks to the black market for ancient artifacts. The Bible they saved wasn't just a historic artifact. It was a guardian of other groundbreaking discoveries waiting to be discovered by investigators worldwide. Those law enforcement heroes stopped the bad guys in their tracks, preventing them from wiping out more invaluable pieces of our past. No one really knows where this ancient Bible came from or who wrote it, say the investigators. After sitting around collecting dust for centuries, the cover got wrecked by some smugglers who clearly didn't care about preserving these rare and delicate treasures. It's a shame, really. These artifacts are hard to find, and once they're rescued, they're still at risk of getting messed up if they're not looked after properly in a museum. The Bible, despite being in a language that's over 2,000 years old, still has this cool feature that any Christian would recognize instantly. It's got a bunch of illustrations made with gold leaf, a technique that's been kicking around for ages. Researchers dug deep and found traces of some historical big shots in there. There's this spot-on picture of Jesus' face and a bunch of drawings of Mary, all with descriptions written in Assyrian. Assyrian is like a distant cousin of Akkadian, a Semitic language spoken in Mesopotamia back in the days. It's extinct now, but it's pretty wild that these ancient illustrations are still kicking around, telling story of times long gone. This really old way of speaking has been around for about two and a half thousand years. It was forgotten for about 2,000 years, even though people tried to steal and secretly move it. The Bible only has about 50 pages that still look okay. The pictures on it are really amazing art. No one knows who made them, but they must have been famous artists at that time. The pictures aren't just normal drawings, they're like super impressive pieces of art. The place called Tokat is kind of famous for sneaking around and taking really important things from history. The cops found this super valuable artwork, a picture of a man standing alone, made by Vincent van Gogh. They found it in the trunk of a car, and it's a special kind of drawing on tan paper that's worth about 500,000 euros. A bunch of countries made agreements with each other to stop these sneaky smugglers from making money off of stolen stuff. Back in 2008, Egypt and Italy shook hands on a plan to track down stolen ancient treasures. Fast forward, 
and they've managed to snatch back more than 195 historical objects and a whopping 21,660 coins that had taken a shady detour through the black market. The action wasn't limited to behind-the-scenes maneuvers. There were some real-life missions around Tokar's center that led the cops to nab an antique Bible. Ten people were in cuffs, all because three shady characters were peddling pieces of history. If it weren't for some savvy police work, that Bible might have vanished into the hands of a slick professional group. Theologians are buzzing with excitement, thinking those 51 pages from the ancient book could spill the beans on some of Jesus' life mysteries and shed light on how Christianity has evolved over a cool millennium. Despite the discovery, the theologians are playing it cool and keeping tight-lipped about the details. Looks like the real story behind those pages is still locked away in mystery. Hidden within the mysterious pages of this ancient Bible lies a secret so profound that no official declaration has dared to unveil its intricate contents. Some doubters argue that the truth may forever elude us, fearing the extraordinary shock that could accompany the revelation of these concealed documents. Initially dismissed as mere pages, the true value of this enigmatic book was brought to light by astute researchers. Astonishingly, each page was carefully crafted from pure gold, a discovery that added a layer of mystery to the already puzzling narrative. With only 51 of these golden pages remaining, the question arises. What if the foundations of Christian teachings, rooted in centuries-old Bibles, were suddenly upended? Two seemingly innocuous phrases on pertinent themes have the potential to reshape the entire teaching of a church. The beliefs and teachings of Christianity, anchored in Bibles dating back over two millennia, stand susceptible to a model shift brought forth by any new narrative that may emerge in the future. The scene of discovery, where a thousand-year-old artifact becomes the foundation in unraveling one of the world's most famous histories. These newfound additions play a crucial role in enriching our understanding of the past, injecting critical facts into the shade of history. The various testaments unveiled over the years may not always align seamlessly, owing to minor variations within the scriptures. Written by numerous authors, the Bible's diversity can spring forth surprises, challenging the predetermined ideas that have endured through the ages. In Turkey, a mind-blowing discovery was made 22 years ago that shook up everything we thought we knew about Jesus. Forget minor discrepancies. This finding turned our understanding upside down. What was found wasn't just any Bible, but the ancient writings of St. Barnabas, a close companion of Paul. This isn't our ordinary book. It's valued at a staggering $28 million, thanks to its game-changing historical insights. Even photocopies of its pages might cost more than a whopping $1.5 million. St. Barnabas wrote this treasure in the same language Jesus spoke. Syriac and Aramaic. Experts delving into its mysteries suggest it could be over 1,500 years old. According to this ancient script, Jesus wasn't crucified. Instead, it tells a tale of Judas facing the cross while Jesus ascended to the heavens, alive and well. Back in the day, there was a holy council in charge of selecting Bible content. They seemingly snubbed the gospel of Barnabas and its crew, favoring the classics. Some researchers believe it got the cold shoulder because it skips the death tale of St. Barnabas, leaving him as the only saint without a death story in the canon. This mysterious book got everyone worldwide scratching their heads, and even the Vatican couldn't resist taking a spy. The experts who delved into it vouch for its authenticity, debunking the idea that it's just made-up stuff. The Catholic Church, with its rich history, has always been a magnet for curious minds. They might not spill all the beans, think ancient scriptures and the Vatican's secret archive, a colossal 53 miles of hidden knowledge. The Bible, a fascinating mix of writings from way back in the year 1000 BC, has captured the hearts of millions who consider it sacred truth. Legend has it that Moses and others penned down this story, including the famous Good Samaritan and the amazing moment when Jesus fed a whole crowd with just five loaves and two fish. 
In the present scheme of printed books, the Bible reigns supreme, boasting a mind-blowing five billion copies worldwide. The original version had more stories than today's editions, with 14 texts that didn't quite make the cut, sparking whispers about church secrets. Ancient stories and mysterious texts floating around motivate people's curiosity. Ever heard of demonic possession? It's the spine-chilling concept where a demon takes the reins of someone's actions without their consent. Religious scholars from Italy and Ireland, representing both the Vatican and Anglican traditions, come together to acknowledge the unsettling reality of demonic possession in our modern world. But there's a collective warning about the dangers of spiritual abuse. Father Dino, an exorcist from Sicily, shed light on the church's awareness of the ongoing debate around witchcraft. He stresses the importance of rigorous, black magic training, recognizing the inevitability of mistakes in this mystical kingdom. The secrets of ancient texts and the scary dance with demons continue to captivate minds as the debate unfolds. Over in Ireland, Father Collins has become a go-to guide for people seeking comfort and help in the face of what they think are evil forces. Lately, the demand for his advice has shot up. Imagine scenes from the stories about Jesus in the New Testament, where he does these amazing things and kicks out demons from troubled souls. Catholic priests think that being possessed can show up in different ways, like obsession. That means suddenly acting crazy, having obsessive thoughts, and feeling a dark urge to end one's life. As unconsciousness takes over, this otherworldly force called the Entity shows up. It makes its victims go against everything they believe in. There's a hidden realm where strange things happen. When people become aware of it, a mysterious force called the Entity takes control. In the world of Catholic beliefs, this whole situation is a heavy burden on the person going through it. It's like they accidentally invited dark powers into their life. It's not just limited to people. Objects, animals, and even houses can get tangled up with these demonic forces. It's like a creepy influence that goes beyond the usual. Then there's this weird thing called subjection. It's like giving up freedom willingly. The person agrees to let their body become a tool for the unholy, like they're volunteering to be a vessel for something not so nice. The Catholic teachings say we shouldn't jump to conclusions. Just because someone's acting weird doesn't mean they're possessed. Demonic influence might pretend to be a mental issue, and it's super important to tell the difference. A sorcery. It's a serious ritual, and only a top-tier bishop has the power to do it. They have to follow specific rules to make sure things don't go out of control. Reality doesn't always follow the rule book. In the secret corners of the supernatural world, some people skip the official route. Instead of waiting for the church's approval, they turn to unofficial witches. It's like a hidden war between good and evil happening in the shadows. The usual rules get twisted, and desperate people look for salvation way outside the lines that are supposed to be followed. Imagine stumbling upon these sayings that are like a remix of the usual New Testament stuff. It's like Jesus decided to drop his own mixtape, and some tracks feel familiar, like echoes from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But then there's track 17, and Paul, the Apostle, gives it a shout-out in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. The rest of the sayings? Nowhere to be found in the mainstream scriptures. Apostle Thomas might be in the mix, but we're not kidding ourselves into thinking he's the real author. It's like Matthew and John weren't the masterminds behind the New Testament game. The name Thomas means twin in Aramaic and Syriac. The ancient texts paint Thomas as Jesus' spiritual twin, someone who vibes with Jesus on a deep level. How does Thomas do it? By getting some knowledge, which is basically saving our soul through this mind-blowing, first-hand understanding of the real spiritual deal. The Gospel of Thomas is like a roadmap for a mystical transformation, showing how to reach Jedi-level enlightenment. Jesus basically spills the cosmic tea by saying, Take a sip of my wisdom and you'll be on my wavelength. Instead of straight up revealing the cosmic 411 every time his crew asks, Jesus drops cryptic hints and challenges them with riddles. Back in the Christian early bird days, 
people were buzzing with excitement about Jesus making a comeback and God's kingdom throwing a grand entrance party. It was a major deal, way bigger than average hypey. The Gospel of Thomas was basically throwing shady at the usual way people saw it. The kingdom of God isn't some far off thing. The kingdom of God is more like a vibe, a spiritual state someone can tap into at any time. The Gospel of Thomas is like the ultimate handbook for a spiritual glow up, guiding readers to reach mystic heights just like Jesus. Jesus drops the knowledge bomb saying, take a sip of wisdom from my words and you'll be on my wavelength. I'll be on yours and the universe's secrets will start spilling the tea to you. But Jesus isn't handing out the secrets on a silver platter. He's more of a cryptic riddles and cosmic escape room kind of teacher. Back in the early Christian days, everyone was buzzing about Jesus making a comeback and God's kingdom throwing a grand entrance party. It was a massive deal, way bigger than it is now. The Gospel of Thomas comes in throwing shade at the usual way people perceive it. According to Thomas, the kingdom of God isn't some distant thing, it's actually chilling inside and all around. The kingdom of God is more like a vibe, a spiritual state that can be tapped into any time. But there's a catch. Someone needs to score some knowledge, that secret knowledge, to unlock it. Scholars think this Gospel of Thomas thing was put together in the late 1st or early 2nd century. It's ancient, playing with the same sayings from the first Christian's era. The author wasn't vibing with the New Testament Gospels, no signs they even knew about them. The Gospel of Thomas was a rebel without a cause. Even when Thomas and the New Testament talk about the same things, the sayings are different. It's like the author of Thomas had some behind-the-scenes info from the Gospels, stuff not in the main script. Thomas skipped some Jesus quotes that could have really spiced up its theological game. Back in the day, people were all about the Gospel of Thomas vibe. Early Christian writers were dropping its name, showing it was the cool thing in late antiquity. Despite some attempts to keep it secret, the Gospel of Thomas stuck around until the 5th and 6th centuries. Fast forward to today and we've got two surviving copies. One's a broken Greek version, probably its original language. The other is this almost complete translation in Coptic in the Nag Hammadi Library. For ages, people have been scratching their heads over what Jesus really looked like. Despite all the fancy official versions, they're not spilling the beans. Pictures spill the beans without saying a word. That's why the Western world has this one image of Jesus. Long, flowing hair, fair skin, a beard, and eyes so deep and blue they're practically crystal clear. Some people say someone can spot this version of Jesus in a bunch of fancy cathedrals and those artsy glass windows. It's an idea that's been passed down through the generations. People who picked it up never really questioned it even though it's not the real deal. The story goes that this whole thing started back in the Byzantine era. Those Byzantine people saw Jesus in a different light, not literally, but more as a symbol of peace. So when they drew him, he got this calm vibe and a super fancy robe. They made up their own pictures of what Jesus might look like after he came back from the dead, but they didn't bother making it look real. It's kind of like how the old Greek gods dressed, with their flowing robes and those extravagant sculptures. The gods always had long hair and big beards, and that tradition stuck around. If you look at old pictures of the Greek god Zeus, the artists in the Byzantine Empire were basically trying to make Jesus look like a young Zeus. In the old days, some Christians wanted to show Jesus as a regular guy, making him look like an everyday person with short hair and no beard. There are some wild thinkers who suggest that the face of Jesus was based on the son of a famous pope, Cesare Borgia. They say that Jesus was first shown as not looking European because of his Jewish roots. But Borgia wasn't a fan of that, so he told artists to make Jesus look more European. Pope Alexander IV used his son as a model for this new European-looking Jesus. In 21, an investigator tried to imagine what an average guy from that time and place might look like. They used a real skull found in the same area and year Jesus was born. 
but surprisingly, the final result didn't match the traditional Western idea of what Jesus looked like at all. Jesus is a man from the small town of Nazareth, one of Galilee's bustling cities. He doesn't look anything like those classic European depictions we often see. The Bible we have in hand hints that the figure portrayed on its pages might just be the real deal, Jesus himself. Interestingly, this Bible connects us to the early days of Christianity, a time when people thought it was all about Catholicism until this discovery reshaped our understanding. Surprisingly, the roots of this ancient book trace back to Assyrian, the language it was written in. This Bible is like a treasure collection, offering a fresh perspective on early Christian history. And there's the Leningrad Codex, a time capsule dating back to the 3rd century, where you'll find the earliest glimpses of humanity's encounter with Christianity. By unraveling those early days, we can craft more accurate theories and sketch out the intricate tapestry of the seven different branches that emerged. However, this Bible is no pristine artifact. It's weathered and worn thanks to smugglers who tried to snatch its secrets. Despite the damage, it still reveals snippets of history. As we flip through its pages, we catch glimpses of individuals from the past. These aren't your typical cookie-cutter images. They might just be the most authentic depictions we have.